So I'm coming to you from North Shire Books, uh, known as one of America's great independent bookstores. And today we are talking with Jamie Bernstein, the oldest child of American icon, composer, and conductor Leonard Bernstein. And I first met Jamie last spring when she was a featured guest at the Dorset Theater Festival's fundraiser. And Jamie, uh, at that event, you performed the narration uh, while a noted pianist played some of your father's uh, music, right? That's right. Uh, my father wrote these little piano sketches that he called anniversaries, and each one was dedicated to somebody of importance in his life. Uh, mentors, colleagues, friends and relatives, all kinds of people. And so uh, I like to do this evening where I talk about the people to whom each of these sketches is dedicated and then taken as a whole, they present a kind of portrait of my dad. And the uh, pianist that night was Michael Boriskin, who's a fantastic pianist and a friend of mine. So we had such a fun time bringing this to Dorset, it was great. So Jamie, your book was published by HarperCollins in the summer of 2018, and it is now out in paperback, and it has received many outstanding reviews, famous father, girl, a memoir, Growing Up Bernstein. And one of the uh, things that, uh, when we talk about reviews, uh, the New York Times book review uh, by Alexandra Jacobs. Uh, she starts out describing a conflict that you may have witnessed over time through the late author Tom Wolfe, uh, who wrote the famous essay, Radical Chic, That Party at Lenny's. Uh, it sort of became a defining moment of sorts when your father introduced politics into his otherwise focused music career, right? Well, I feel like I'm going to spend the rest of my life uh, correcting the record on this occasion, this, which became this sort of inflamed incident. Um, for starters, it wasn't a party. It was a fundraising event with snacks and things to drink. And second of all, it was my mother who presented it. Uh, she was very involved with uh, the ACLU and the Committee for Public Justice, and these 21 members of the Black Panther Party had been jailed awaiting trial on these totally trumped up charges. The minute the trial began, the judge threw the whole thing out. It was just nonsense. But meanwhile, they were stuck in jail waiting for the trial date. So this fundraiser was to put some money together for the families to keep going while the guys were all stuck in jail. That's what the evening was about. And it was my mother's event. And my dad wandered into it halfway through. And of course, the minute he walked in the door, all eyes were on Lenny because he was so magnetic. And it all sort of became about him. The other thing was that there was no press invited to this event, but a couple sneaked in. And one of the ones who sneaked in was Tom Wolfe. He actually stole the invitation off of David Halberstam's desk at New York Magazine. A little interesting footnote for you there. Anyway, he wound up writing this immortally snarky essay about the occasion and just, you know, made these sneering descriptions of everybody and everything. And, and, it, and it was eventually included in this book, Radical Chic, uh, which had another essay in it as well. So it just kind of put this whole occasion on the map in this completely misrepresented way. And well, my, you know, my parents, my mother especially, was just trying to do something good in the world. You say no press and, and that it was a uh, party that your father stopped in on. Uh, well, he was coming home yeah, from a rehearsal, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I remember at the time it was huge, uh, reading about it and everything. It became yes, a huge it was. media. And uh, not only because of Tom Wolfe, but also because there was uh, one of the other press people who sneaked in was the society editor of the New York Times, Charlotte Curtis. And she, too, wrote a very snarky piece about the occasion. And then, incredibly, for reasons I don't quite understand, the New York, New York Times felt 
moved to write an uh, editorial excoriating my parents for representing and supporting Black Panthers who were considered anti-Zionist and and they, they, they made a big stink about it. So what with one thing and another, it was front and center for a while, yeah. Yeah, yeah. When I was growing up as a student in elementary and secondary school and, and college, Leonard Bernstein symbolized to me my connection, uh, my relevance with the great historic composers that you would read about, but they seem so far away from... Uh, you know, the Middle Ages or the 1600s or 1700s uh, that you'd read about and study. And as a youngster to me, Leonard Bernstein was my connection, uh, my relationship to classical music. Is this because uh, you were watching the Young People's Concerts well, on television? That, that was certainly one of the uh, shows that was an influence on me, the Young People's Concerts. And of course, the scores like West Side Story uh, that your father wrote. And uh, uh, so that was an influence on me as a young person. Uh, again, my connection to classical music. He had an ability to bring that. Yes, he did. He was a really gifted communicator. And he was really good on television. And it's just one of those weird things. Some people are just really good on TV. He's one of those people. I remember one night finding him a program of his on one channel and flipping around, I found Emeril, the chef, on another channel. They, they couldn't be more different, Emeril and Leonard Bernstein. And, but I started toggling back and forth between the two channels because I realized they both had that exact same quality of seeming to j jump right out of the screen and kind of grab you by the sleeve and say, listen to this. I am excited about this and I have to share it with you. That was the thing that my father had. It's why he was such a good teacher. But as a composer uh, and in the classical realm, realm, he wasn't pigeonholed or smug in his little element. He, he understood the importance of reaching out to uh, uh, appeal to a broad public. And I would say that even today, uh, and, and he was competing, too, with rock and roll or country western. And, and even today, a lot of composers don't know how to go about that, you know. And, well, the thing that happened back conductors. in the, when he was composing in the mid-20th century, uh, in order to be considered a, a so-called, you know, serious co composer, you absolutely had to write in a 12-tone style, which meant you couldn't use any melodies and your music could not be in any key and it had to be very sort of cerebral and kind of chilly and intellectual and my father was perfectly able to write in that style if he felt like it but he wouldn't give up writing a tune for which we are now very grateful but at the time it meant that he was sacrificing his reputation as a serious composer during his lifetime so actually the choices that he made about what to compose uh, were, were very daring and, and damaging to his overall reputation at the time. But of course, by now, um, we're all out of that 12-tone straitjacket, and today's composers feel that they can write in any style they want. So they look to Bernstein as their role model for being that kind of a composer. But as a, as a composer and conductor, he built a constituency, so to speak, you know, which, which <laughs> yes, again, so was... many composers and conductors don't, don't do that today. They, they can't. Well, maybe they try. Some do, I guess. And, you know, I, I have to say that Leonard Bernstein came along at the right moment and was such an unusual combination of elements. It was a real, you know, alignment of the planets and that's hard to replicate. You know, he was able to jump for easily from one genre to the other, Broadway and symphonic music and jazz and choral music. And, you know, he could write in so many different styles. Plus he was a conductor, plus he was a teacher, plus he was an activist, plus he was pretty easy on the eyes. And, 
and were, it was great on TV. So this, this was a very big, unusual package, and that's hard to replicate, I guess. Now, for many years, he was the brand and face of the New, New York Philharmonic, of course. He was their conductor for many years, yeah. and that was the period in which he was doing the Young People's Concerts on television. So at that, in those years, Leonard Bernstein was ubiquitous, and that's why I named my book uh, what I called it, because my second grade classmate, Lisa, used to tease me by calling me famous father girl. And because everybody saw him on TV. And, and again, for the New York Philharmonic, he broadened the base and interest level uh, by, by what he did, by his presence. Enormously, there. yes. You know? And in the Young People's Concerts, he would often use pop music for examples to explain whatever he was talking about. So, you know, when he was describing sonata form, he went to the piano and he played and sang And I Love Her by the Beatles. And all the kids in the audience were squealing and squirming with delight. And it was a really good way to keep their attention focused on what he was talking well, for, about. For a lot of classical music uh, for young people, it wasn't frightening and intimidating. And it wasn't off limits. That's right. The way he, he never talked down to the kids. And he always brought them up a notch and told them stuff that might be over their heads, but in a way that they could relate to. Now, uh, when he was the conductor at the Met, he saw the transition the, uh, when the legendary old Met on Broadway uh, closed down and everything transitioned to Lincoln Center. Did he ever speak about that? Well, I mean, his focus was more on the other side of Lincoln Center where Philharmonic Hall was. But he did conduct at the Met a few times. He conducted uh, Cavalleria Rusticana there, and he conducted Carmen there with Marilyn Horn. And so, yeah, he had some innings at the Met, but mainly he was at the Philharmonic. But that was a period where I think, from I remember reading about it, a lot of uh, people in classical music were... Uh, uh, you know, depressed that this grand old uh, opera house was, uh, you know, going by the boards and uh, things were moving uh, up to Lincoln Center. Uh, yeah, people hate change. So, you know. They hate change. So. And the old Met was beautiful. It was like a jewel. And the new Met was sort of, you know, glitzy and modern. And so, yeah, there were a lot of uh, unhappy campers. As a child... When did you first realize that your father and perhaps your mother were different from ordinary, typical parents, oh. that your father was a unique celebrity uh, and that your mother was very prominent? When, when did that first, uh, you know? Well, my brother and sister and I get asked this question quite often. So we cooked up this semi-joke answer to the question, which is that uh, the, the penny really dropped about our dad when we were watching the Flintstones and Betty and Wilma were going to the Holly Rock Bowl to hear Leonard Bernstone conduct. And we thought, wow, they mentioned him on the Flintstones. He must have really hit the big time. And that th it is true that this uh, episode exists. Um, but in point of fact, I think we were starting to figure it out once our dad was on television. Because, you know, back in those days, Television was everything. And if a person was on TV, they were important. So I think, you know, by, certainly by second grade when I was being teased and called famous father girl, that penny was dropping, that my dad was unusual and that made me different. And I write about this in the book because it made me uncomfortable. I, I wanted to be like everybody else. I wanted to be normal. What I really wanted was to be just like the kids on Leave it to Beaver, the kids on TV who lived in the suburbs and rode their bikes around the block. And that, that's what I thought real life was. And I was a little regretful that my life in New York City was so not what life was like on television. But as, as a youngster, you and your siblings uh, had many experiences and uh, uh, perks of, of, and, and courtesies extended to you that, again, the average ordinary youngster growing up wouldn't experience. I know there was uh, one uh, 
experience, I think, when you were four, meeting the Beatles, right? Oh, I was older than that. Okay. But yes, I mean, the, the irony is that all I wanted was to be normal, but actually I was having the most extraordinary childhood uh, with all these amazing experiences and travel and meeting amazing people, including, yes, the Beatles. And I was such a Beatle maniac. There, are, there is no way for me to convey what a big deal they were for me. So meeting the Beatles was like looking into the four faces of God. And I was beside myself. But seeing that your father was sort of on par with them uh, from his uh, element of music uh, and the Beatles with, with rock and roll, that your father was on, uh, on an equal level with them. Well, not as far as I was concerned. <laughs> the Beatles were up here. And I'm, I was very happy that my dad had this delightful, prominent career, but really that mattered way less to me than the Beatles did back then. So despite the prof uh, professional acclaim that your father uh, received and the exciting life that your parents led, your book describes how there were many emotional and difficult challenges, right? Right. So, I mean, there, there is no such thing as total happiness in human beings or in their families. Obviously, we all have ups and downs. But in my family, where my parents were both sort of larger than life, that just made the ups upper and the downs downer, I guess. One uh, impression I got from the book, gathered through the constant cigarette smoke, uh, the regular late afternoon drinking, uh, perhaps some upper pills, uh, which it becomes more of a commentary about the culture of success-driven, fast-lane people in the 60s and 70s. It does. And well, I mean, you know, this was the way not just people in the arts, but I think uh, in general in the United States, there was this very high level of smoking and drinking everywhere. It's just what people did. And uh, sleeping pills and then uppers also became highly available to one and all. And, and created a lot of problems. For my father, it was a problem because he was a genuine insomniac. He had a motor he could not shut off. So sometimes he really had to rely on sleeping pills. But then what if he had a 10 a.m. rehearsal? Then he had to take the upper to pull himself out of the, you know, that, that stupor from the sleeping pill. And so as he got older, he ping-ponged back and forth more and more between those two kinds of medications. And when you get older, your body is less adept at metabolizing all those drugs. And so I think it really interfered with his health. Well, uh, going back to that period in the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, you didn't have the negativity on using these things either uh, back then. Well, it was, exactly. It was accepted culturally. That's right. So It's what everybody did. Everybody smoked. Nobody thought about the hazards. And if they did think about the hazards, they didn't think about it for very long. And uh, I talk a lot in the book about smoking. And in the beginning, I just describe a lot about how there was always that smell in the air and how awful it was when my parents would light up in the car because, you know, they would very grandly crack the window open about an inch and that, that didn't hardly help at all. So. It was around all the time. We had ashtrays on every flat surface in the house. But then as the book uh, progresses, further along in the story, you come to find out that first my mother and then my father both died of lung cancer. So the smoking element turns out to be totally germane to the story. And, and they died relatively young, too. I mean, your mother yeah. died in her 50s, I, I she believe, She was only right? 56, very and, young. And your father died at, at 72, I yes. believe, right? I, I mean, mean, you know... He, they he, probably he, both had a lot to do yet in terms of their life, right? Of course they I mean, did, yeah. You know, so... I wish we'd had them around a whole lot longer. Oh, I mean, they. it was kind of a premature uh, death for both of them. Yes, it was. So... Um, so um, you capture this great worldly man in the book, this uh, universally recognized person, but yet he was a very basic 
a human being at home, right? I mean, he was. I mean, you know, people who experienced Leonard Bernstein visually as a conductor primarily always saw him in white tie and tails or a suit, and so he might have seemed very formal and kind of maybe stiff or something. And in real life, he couldn't have been more different. He was very relaxed, very earthy and hilarious. And he loved jokes and he loved movies and pop music. And, you know, he was really a, a person in the world and he really loved his kids. We never felt unwelcome in his presence and he loved nothing more than to just get on the floor and play with us or you know, take us to an amusement park or, you know, stuff like that. He was, in that way, he was a wonderful, very warm, hugging, loving dad. You never felt that you were competing for his time with all of these people uh, uh, that wanted a piece of him or a part of him? Yes, of or, course we've, you know. we had to compete with all those other yeah. demands. And he was on the road a lot. But when he came home, he was so there for mm -hmm. us when he was there that that made up a lot for the fact that he was absent the rest of the time. Mm -hmm. And he did apparently keep crazy odd hours, right? I mean, working yeah, well, till as I mentioned, four in the morning. He was a total and, uh, insomniac. You know, so actually, yeah. his best hours for getting work done were between like about, you know, two and five a.m. when the rest of the world was asleep and the phone finally stopped ringing and people weren't bothering him and he could finally concentrate and, you know, write some notes down. But isn't that true of a lot of successful creative people who were driven to finish a project or uh, see uh, something through? I'm right? sure it is true, yeah. You know, uh, I, mean, lot, there, I mean, there are a lot of night owls in this world, and I'm thinking that it might be a genetically inherited characteristics, characteristic because both my kids are night owls and really hate when they have to get up early. It really hurts them to, to have to do that. Now, uh, you deal in the book with your father's gay proclivities uh, and his affairs and how it affected uh, your, your mother uh, and your siblings and you, you know? Yes. Well, uh, this is uh, in the middle of the book, when, around the time that I started to realize that, that my father had this sort of double identity. And I was in college when I began to understand that this was happening. And it made life very complicated. And it was not easy to talk about these things back in those days. In the year when my parents separated and my father went off to live with a man, we didn't have the vocabulary to talk about such things too well back in the 70s. Now we do. The, these circumstances are still challenging for everyone concerned, but it's something that is acknowledged and happens quite often and people talk about it. Back then, we, it was so hard to talk about. And for my mother especially, and she was such a, an intensely private person. And so for her, it was very hard to contend with this situation and find the words to talk about. And I actually think that's one of the reasons that I felt compelled to write this book so that I could now finally find the words to talk about, to express what it was that we were all going through back then at a time when we couldn't express any of it. You tell a story in the book about your brother studying at Harvard, which was imposed on him uh, somewhat by your father. Well, right? uh, to, all three of us, to, I would say. Okay, okay. And then graduating... And then uh, your brother damaging his diploma on the front door? <laughs> well, my brother's time at Harvard was even more fraught than mine was. And he dropped out for a while, and then our mother died, and then he finally went back and finished. So the whole process of going through those Harvard years was a real ordeal for him. So when he finally graduated, he had a graduation party up at our house in Connecticut, and he stuck his diploma to the front door of the house with a kitchen knife. And that just said it all. So uh, once again, it wasn't all glamour and glory, uh, the Bernstein household. There were emotional issues. There were uh, hard times uh, that sure. in, in terms of uh, you and your uh, siblings uh, being raised. It, uh, right. I mean, was... the one good part was that 
my brother and sister and I were, remained so close. And we really helped each other get through those tough patches by being so connected one to the other. It helped all three of us. It really helped me when I had a brother who was so close in age to me. We kind of grew up together. And then later, our little sister came along. And then she was grateful to have these older siblings to help her through and keep her company. Uh, you know, when we lost our mother, our, our sister was only 16 when our mother died. That's a terrible age to lose your mother. So Alexander and I did everything we could to, be as, to stay as close to Nina as we could. And I think that really bonded us for life. What professional, uh, what, what piece of work, uh, what accomplishment was your father most proud of? The way, where he found the greatest fulfillment? You know, at the end of his life, he, he talked about that. And he really felt that, that his biggest contribution was as a teacher. But he wanted to be remembered as a composer. So it was a little of both, I would say. And, and was there one piece of work that he really felt uh, proud of, especially uh, You mean a composition of, yeah, of his? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, he was often asked, you know, what's your favorite piece that you wrote? And he said, oh, but they're like my children and I can't pick favorites, you know. But um, I think if you really pressed him on the point, maybe he would talk about his theater work mass because he put so much of himself in mass. It's almost like a self-portrait. And, and it really, uh, he made himself so vulnerable in that piece. So I think there's really more of him in that one in mass than there is in anything else he wrote. So maybe he has a particularly uh, close relationship to that piece. Which of the great composers did he admire the most? Oh, well, I mean, he had a, a real live mentor in his life, and that was Aaron Copland. Uh, they were really close friends as well as colleagues. So that was a very important composer in my father's life. But he also super admired, uh, well, in the 20th century, Stravinsky, Shostakovich. He loved Benjamin Britten. Uh, and his friend Lucas Foss was a composer he really admired too. Then in the 19th century, oh, you know, Brahms was one of his all-time favorites. And going further back, Beethoven. Beethoven was everything. We've been talking with Jamie Bernstein. She's the author of Famous Father Girl. It's uh, published by HarperCollins. Uh, it's gotten a lot of attention, uh, the book. It's now out in soft cover. Uh, did very well in hard copy and I urge you to uh, read it. Uh, this is Danny Frank for GNAT TV. <laughs> Boy, talk about timing. <laughs> that was, that was <laughs> That's pretty good.